All right. So, Kim, mm -hmm. one of the things we talk about when we mention bad movies, we talk about It's Alive from like 1980 or something, The Brainiac from the 1960s, and these ancient things. Well, I guess maybe Jaws the Revenge isn't as ancient, but it's like 80s, right? Yes. So, why is you've often talked about you feel that modern bad movies are unenjoyable. Unenjoyable. Even, so, tell us tell us why you hate modern bad movies. Okay, well, to get back to the bell curve idea, I think in a larger sense, the problem is that studios spend so much money on movies now and want them to make so much money. Like, they want every movie to make, like, a billion dollars. So they're terrified of it not following a formula. Uh, they basically have all these layers that stamp all the individuality out of the movie. And so it's not just that the movies aren't, as bad as they used to be, but they're not as good as they used to be either. Like, I think you need... Everything's let, more mediocre? Yeah, you need... So a, that a modern bad movie is just dull. Yes, which is the worst possible. All the all the stuff is, like, in the middle of the bell curve. It's in the boring section. So the the good ones are sort of generally... Right. For example, the Avengers, which most people like, a yeah. film critic can pick it to shreds with the errors that are in it. That make it not, yeah, a, great, even not I, a great movie. To be fair, because I'm a Marvel guy, I loved all the Marvel, the first 22 Marvel movies. Now I'm kind of, I'm sort of sated. I won't say I'm burned out, but I got 22 movies in 10 years. I don't know if I need more than that okay. now. Now, there are occasionally still spectacularly bad movies. We have like The Room and things like that. Yes. So, so what's, what's, what, where are these coming from? I think these are, if I were to look at the last 30 years and what were the spectacularly bad movies... These tend to be what could be called vanity films. Like, they're films in which, and this ties into what I was saying. Birdemic. Yeah, Birdemic. These are films uh, where one individual got the power to put their own personal creative vision on the screen. And sometimes they're like big studio films. Like, John Travolta made Battlefield Earth because he was right. a Scientologist. And that was that was in the nineties, right? But that was yes. that's actually but that was after the time when there was the famous bad movies. Yes. Search. Uh yeah, because I like I don't think that there's been a wave of great movie of great bad movies really in like thirty or forty years. I think the seventies yeah. and, and to an extent the early eighties were the last And time. actually to be fair, I, I often hear people talking, especially horror fans, about how great the eighties were for yeah. horror movies. But part of that's because in the eighties they were free to make really bad movies too. Yes. There was to be bad and good and so you had this huge range of stuff. Yes. And uh so you get awesome things like the Boogans. Yeah, well the you know, the, the advantage of the eighties is house. they were still making low budget horror Every movies animator. and you were flooding yeah. the market because of video home video so if you make a thousand uh movies some of them are going to be really good and, and some that's the one people talk bad. about and you can find yeah. so you can go out there and you can find reanimator correct um now again but now that doesn't happen yeah again the studios have decided like oh we can make horror movies too i mean that started really with like the omen yeah horror movies used to be like Movies that the... They were scorned by the studios. Yeah, the studios were too sniffy. They thought they were too good to make horror movies. And then, like, The Exorcist made, like, a zillion dollars. And everybody decided to jump on that train. And there was a studio film, but, like, I guess Rosemary's Baby was one of the first, like, big studio horror movies. Mm -hmm. And then once they realized how much money they could make, then they started making them. But, which, but still, a lot of the great horrors from that time period, like Texas Chainsaw yes, Massacre... Yes, independence. They're not... They're independence. Yeah. Even Alien, I think. Yeah, and all made, <clears throat> even though we have this idea that by right, artists should mature and their work should get better as they get older, action movies and horror movies, the the classic ones from the 70s on, were almost invariably made by people making their first or second movie. Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Nightmare on Elm Street. You can really go through the list. And, and then they never really get back to that. They, yeah, peak. they they never get back to those peaks. I, mean, I still like Toby Hooper. I still yeah. like Wes Craven. I still John, right. John Carpenter had a had a a wave of movies that were really good. Uh, you know, the the I like The Fog a lot more than a lot of other people like it. But the thing, well, everyone likes the thing. Yeah, right? everybody it's, likes the thing. Everybody likes uh, these days. Everybody likes. Uh, Big Trouble in Little China. He had he had a wave of movies that people really liked, and then he just kind of went in the tank. I think his last great movie was In the Mouth of Madness, which I really like. But after that, it was like dreadful, dreadful movies. So there is something about being young and 
and working with a small amount of money. I actually think one of the problems with Hollywood is it has too much money. And it, people get lazy and they want to solve all the problems in post. It sounds like a Hollywood problem to me because it is. speaking as a guy that likes uh, movies from, from, from Italy, yeah. then like Lucio Fulci, when he started making his classic horrors, that was he'd done decades of other movies yes. before then. He made comedies and westerns, and then he suddenly starts doing like Zombie Two and right. and The House by the Cemetery, and there. And I really like those. And they are. And he it wasn't his first thing. Or yeah, Dario Argento would actually he started right off making giallos, but then his movies got were good. Yes, so it kept being it got stronger. Mm-hmm. Then they kind of got weaker. They kind of became yeah. erratic in the nineties and two thousands, but they were generally really good. And then you have Mario Bava whose movies were always strong. Yes. So it's not the same as Hollywood. Maybe it's because they had a different structure to their studios. Yeah, I think, you know... And that Toby Hooper would make Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. and then the evil men in suits who were who secretly hated horror yeah. but wanted to make money off horror came in to, to show that they knew more about horror. Yeah, we all grew up watching movies, just movies. Yeah. And we loved movies, which is why we have the hobbies we have. Um, Hollywood was great when the studio system was around like like that structure uh allowed it, it sounds like it should be stifling because i mean all the actors the studio, hated it right yeah but uh well maybe not the the uh, character actors yeah but you had your john fords you had your howard hawks you had orson wells you had people making great movies in the studio system and again the the ironically the idea when they broke up the studio system was that it should allow for a flourishing of independent talent, but really... I mean, it kind of did in the 70s right. and 80s. But to bring this back ironically in a bad way to what the movie we were most talking about earlier, which is Jaws, Jaws was the first movie to make $100 billion. And Hollywood overnight changed like what it wanted to do. It was like, I don't want to make a $12 million movie that makes $25 million and you get like a $10 million profit. I want a $80 million profit on a $20, $20 million movie. And then as inflation hit, then it was like, now I'm going to spend $100 million. On so a then you finally end million. up with, with, with huge bloated yes. things like Avatar. Yes, where you're spending literally $300 million to make a movie hoping that it makes a billion or two billion dollars. When you're spending that much money, you have to have a lot of guys watching yeah. the purse strings and watching the creative strings and not daring <clears throat> ever to take a chance. Correct. And you also have all these layers of bureaucracy at the suit and everybody wants to pretend that they're contributing something so they, they interfere with the movie in a way that like independent, like Argento, this there was, was nobody this telling This would probably Argento, explain Ghostbusters 2016. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's and this gets back to the idea that they want everything to be a franchise now. Like, mm-hmm. the, like it used to be like when we were kids, very few films could be described as franchises. Like, you could have sequels, but like a franchise is sort of beyond like sequels. It's it's like the James Bond movies were a franchise, and like nobody really went to see Diamonds Are Forever. And thought like this is a sequel to Doctor No. No, it was, it was just a James, it was Bond, a James movie. Bond movie. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, that's why franchises get rebooted so often because they're not really supposed to be sequels after a certain point. Like they're just supposed to be another Halloween, another Terminator, another Predator film. Um, Ghostbusters was an attempt by a studio who just had a list of things that they'd made in the past. Well, they had one kind of good idea, which is let's do bus- Ghostbusters with female protagonists. Yes. That, that inherently that, is not a bad idea. That is not a bad idea. But then, then like, the script was was dull. The jokes didn't yes. go off. The act- they clearly weren't getting the most out of their actresses. They were not. You know, and uh, it's and they, like so many things go wrong in that. And ironically, they had a director who... And it's not a famous bad movie that's, that would be for Rift Traps. It's no. just dull. And, yes. stupid. And, you, and you're sorry that you spent the money to go see it. <laughs> at least at least I was sorry I spent yeah. the money to go see it. And it did not give fans of the original movie what they wanted. Right. Like, nobody that liked Ghostbusters went to see Ghostbusters and were like, this was a worthy successor. And To be fair, I didn't think that about Ghostbusters 2 either, which had the same cast. Yes. But that sucked. But, man, it didn't suck like Ghostbusters 2016. It did not. I think part of the problem, now I have to admit, I didn't go see Ghost. I don't see a lot of modern movies because I find them pretty dreadful uh, Hollywood movies. I mean, you watched... Well, The Shrine isn't really a Hollywood movie. It is not a Hollywood movie. 
Um, it looks like one of the problems with Ghostbuster, ironically, is that the director, in a way, respected the actresses too much, where he was like, these are funny women. We won't really give them a script. We'll just turn the camera on, let them tell jokes in front of the camera, and then we'll try to make a movie out that, of it. That might work with a very, very few yes. group of comedians. Mostly, Robin Williams maybe could pull it off. Mostly people who came up through an improv system. Yes, yes, that's right. That's why the Marx Brothers could do it, because they yes. got their, they like made their bones with hecklers on stage. Yes. And they, they were able to think things on the fly. They came but that's not what a modern there. comedian does. No. Frankly, actually, I'm not even sure Robin Williams could do it. But uh, he would have come. But closer he, he would have come it, closer then, yeah. to it. But a typical modern comedian would not be able to do those things. Yeah, and, and to be fair, it wouldn't always happen then. We just watched this amazing Fred McMurray movie called Murder. Yes. He says, which I highly recommend. Great it's a movie. brilliant example of the old Dark House movie, and he's super super funny in it. But he is not improv in anything. He is not. He's uh, even though he it, he is very tightly controlled. Yes. In fact, uh, in a way that makes it look loose and, and right, right. But, which again, counterintuitively, you think wouldn't work because he's. Not acting as scared as you think he would. Yes. Uh, he's, but he's always seems to be thinking, which is fun. Like, like he's always trying to get out of it. So he yeah. always seems to be like coming up with gambits. Basically, he go. He's a, he's a poll taker that goes to this house to find out what happened to the previous poll taker, and it's full of murderous uh, uh, backwoods people. Yeah. So hillbillies. Basically. Yeah. Basically, it's the Beverly Hillbillies, except they're murderers. Yeah. It's and, pretty funny, uh, and it's really funny. Yeah. I think I, I'll I'll tell you one thing about modern movies that is one reason I don't go to see many modern movies. Is every time they make like, you know, because I grew up and I, you know, like I said, I did like the Marvel movies because I grew up reading Marvel comics. Uh, you know, I grew up watching Bond. I grew up watching Godzilla. I like, I like franchises. I like series. So it's not like I'm inherently against them. But whenever they make a movie now, the first thing, and this is going to sound silly, but the first thing I do when I hear about a new movie that I might be interested in is I check how long it is. Like I don't check who's the star is or who the director. I like, what's the running time? And I remember like when the Lone Ranger was going to come out and I was old enough. I was sort of I like, love the Lone I, Ranger. Yeah, I might like Not the, Lone the Ranger. movie. Not the movie. Reason movie, but I love the Lone Ranger in, inherently as yes. the Lone Ranger. So I was quasi interested in seeing a Lone Ranger movie. Yeah. So I went to the... And, and Johnny Depp, how could he be bad as Tonto? Exactly. You know? So I went to the internet to see how long it was and it was two and a half hours long. Oh. And I'm like, you can't justify two and a half hours for the Lone Ranger. It's, it's ludicrous. It should be 90 minutes. Movies used to be 90 minutes. One of the things about The Lone Ranger is you 100% do not want to have an origin story for The Lone Ranger. Correct. That is the whole point of The Lone Ranger is that no one knows whence he came. Well, okay, to be fair... You could have an origin story yeah. of where Tonto became his friend. He had an origin story in the radio show, which is where he started from. I only saw him on the serials. Yeah, so he, in the, the TV, TV show. show he did not. So he did, and in fact... Uh, trivia note for another character that most people won't know because they're too young. The uh, Lone Ranger was the grandfather of the Green Hornet because they were owned by the same company. You mean canonically? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Is Zorro going there anywhere? I mean, no. Well, he was Mexican, so I know. But Zorro could be the grandfather of the Lone Ranger. They don't talk about him. <laughs> if he was part, Zorro of the... <laughs> was Californian. I know, but he was of Spanish descent. That would, that would have been looked down upon back in the ah. 1880s or whatever. Again, I used to watch old movies, and because they were shorter, they tended to be more efficient. I like efficient movies. Almost everything I see now, I feel like it's 20 or 30 minutes longer than it needs to be. Right. And, and that is sort of like ruined a lot of movies for me. Okay, but we still have some modern movies that are bad that are genuinely bad and fun to watch and yeah. the one that comes to mind of course of everyone is the room, the room. i had another yes. one in mind this slipped my brain uh, uh birdemic or Birdem there's other one another the one besides that there's been <coughs> a neil, neil, the neil, neil green, green movies, movies. Yeah. yeah neil green is incredibly bad but again um, these are these are individual visions of right. insane people and that's how, but that's and those how they, are very entertaining uh, battlefield earth is a vi personal vision of oh yeah uh John star, Travolta. star trek 5 is all about william shatner's ego which makes yeah. it very entertaining Steven Seagal became popular enough that he was given the keys to the kingdom when he made On Deadly Ground, and it is a wonderfully awful movie. He gives it's this bad. He gives a and it has Michael Caine. Yes, and Michael Caine it gives the worst one job of the, I've ever one seen. of the worst performances he's ever given. But oh, I well, feel like he gave Steven Seagal exactly what he asked for. Yes. So you Steve, can't blame Seagal went away happy. Yes, you can't blame Michael Caine. I never will blame Michael Caine. Yeah. 
But it is a wonderfully dreadful movie. And it's super awesome that he walked away from that with his career intact. And Steven yep. Seagal lost everything. Yes. Uh, Steven uh, Seagal's career never recovered from On Deadly Ground. Because it's horrible. It's it's a he wrote it he directed it and then we and then after that his movies were always even worse and cheaper and now yeah. he lives in Russia. No, I know you have a you have an audience, so I don't know if anybody can ever. There's there's a there's a a thought I've always had about an early Seagal movie that if anybody has confirmation of it, I'd like to get it. Oh, say it in the comments, Colin, if you do. I think it was in Hard to Kill, which is the movie where he's he's shot up and he starts the movie in a coma for seven years, and then he gets up. And like two days later, he can fight people, which well, yeah. is pretty amazing. Good to go. But his um, his wife at the time, who was Carrie Otis or maybe somebody, some model that he was married to, yeah. Kelly LeBrock, thank you, uh, off stage voice, um, is a doctor, uh, not too convincingly. And she has a scene early in the movie where she comes to his comatose uh, uh, body in the hospital bed. I hope there's a there's a passionate love scene. Well. This was, Sorry, a touching grief right. scene. With this a, is because this is the early of the movie. This is right after the opening credits. And the one credit that really drew my eye was script by, and then there's a additional dialogue by Steven Seagal. So then we get to Kelly LaRock coming in and ex, like expositoring about how he's been in a coma for seven years. And at one point she lifts the sheets to look to her body and then her eyes clearly drift down to his crotch. And she goes... Oh, and he has so much to live for. Besides, you've got so much to live for. Please wake up. And I was, I turned to the person I was seeing with, and I'm like, now I know what dialogue like Steven Seagal contributed <laughs> to the movie. So I would be willing to bet a hundred dollars that that was one of the lines that like that he put in added to the script. Please wake up. Wow. Yeah, uh, but I will say on Deadly Ground, it, it's it it can be the violence can be a little off putting at times. But it is a wonderful bad movie. If you're looking for a bad action movie, Undeadly Ground. Also, the plot was insane in that one. Isn't that the one where yes. the, the bad guys to save like twenty thousand dollars are willing to risk a multi million dollar? Yes, they're thing? going to. They built the world's biggest. And they left out the bolt. non the non yeah. exploder bolts that keep yeah. your thing from exploding. Exactly. You think you'd always want to put those bolts in so it doesn't explode? Yeah, and. Um, they built the world's biggest oil platform, and then they were going to let it blow up mm -hmm. for reasons. Yeah, uh, it's one of those movies where they think like uh, companies don't have like stockholders, so they can just be as evil as they want to be, like because nobody ever like raises questions at the stockholder meeting about why did you let the giant oil platform blow up? Exactly. This is also the one where Stephen Seagal is not only like the most expert special forces guy or whatever; he's like a brain surgeon or atomic scientist or something. Isn't he like everything? Well, in, in, not in that one. In, in the Patriot, he's the he's everything. He's the, the country's damn best immunologist or something like that. Like, and also a special forces guy. Yes, and a special forces guy. So, underground, he's only a special forces guy. He's a special forces, but now he's a forest ranger. I, I will point and, out that in the movie, it is. I know he's always a lot of really. He's always the best yes. at everything he does. Whatever he does, he's the best at it. In on Deadly, and the bad guys have long monologues about that. In in the uh, in on Deadly Ground, there, he has a vision quest, and they establish that Gia herself has picked him to be her guardian. Nice. nice. Yeah. So he's basically Captain Planet. Well, you know, I'd have to argue that Gaia not having a brain or nervous system might not be the best person to making good choices for her guardian. <laughs> That's to, and, and, which is also suggested by Captain Planet. I'd also like to point out that in Steven Seagal's movies, when they have the bad guy tell me how great Steven Seagal yes, is. Yes, which happens all the time. Which happens all the time. In the first place, I'm underwhelmed because I'd rather see that he's awesome. Yeah. And in the second place, I'm underwhelmed because I'm a huge fan of the TV show The Untouchables. Yes. And they never, ever tell you how scary The Untouchables are. Yes. You just, because Robert... In fact, the bad guys belittle them. Robert Stack doesn't need And Robert be, Stack... Yeah. Under, always underplays it. The bad yeah. guy says, you're yellow. That's what you are. You wouldn't play with the other kids. And yeah. He just says, get out. Yeah, usually get in out. the early <laughs> ones, there was just a scene where somebody would say, this guy's good. That was the normal way. The, like, That's enough. Everybody was impressed by Stephen Skull. Yeah. Now, he wrote on Deadly Ground, so like... They say a lot more. One of the villains... One I've of the, seen on Deadly Ground. Yeah. One of I the was highly entertained. One of the subsidiary villains is played by Arlie Ermey. And he's given this long speech. So you're going to have to tell him who Arlie Army is. Because Arlie Army was the drill instructor in uh, Full Metal Jacket. There you go. So he makes very convincing monologues. Yes. He's the one who gets really shot. good. And he was actually a drill instructor. He was an ex- Okay. I think an ex-Marine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I remember that whole story. Yeah. Okay. 
And so he's given this, if you drop this guy naked in the Antarctic, he'd show up two days later with like five naked women and a fistful of pesos or something like that. Some, and it just goes on and on about like how awesome he is. Uh, and then because it's written by Stephen Skull, at the end of the movie, Arlie Army gets the drop on him, but instead of just shooting him, just continues to talk at him for three minutes and lets Stephen Gall get And some. he knows the guy's the toughest guy. So yeah, he's should, been he telling everybody this guy's the worst dude on the planet. But he has to, like, talk and talk. Steve, anybody sitting in Steven Seagal, you said the signature move where he would flip a guy's gun over? Yes. And But he has to be close enough to, like... Reach the gun. I, I used to have a thing I called Ken's Rule of Guns, which is, like... Never. You still have that thing. It's yes, your thing. It's, this is Ken rules. Ken's rule of guns that you may now apply to your movies. Uh, and the Ken's rule of guns is guns allow you to shoot people from more than like three feet away. So never let your target get like three feet away, particularly if they're Steven Seagal. Yeah. And then he does this thing. And uh, so he did that thing and he killed him. So now, I also like the fact that he didn't understand. So he kills Arlie Army, who is at least like a badass, right? Then like. The but the main villain is like evil oil executive Michael Caine, who was portly and in his sixties at that point. And Steven Seagal proceeds to basically beat him to death, and we're supposed to be cheering him, but you're just watching him like beat up this like sixty year old man when he could just arrest him or or just or shoot him, just shoot him. Steven Seagal was so unlikable, but he thought people liked him that like he didn't understand like how he was coming off. It's it's it's. It's it's an indication of how little he understood people viewed him. Now, is that the one where he has like a, a ten minute dialogue at the end about yes. fuel? He had, well, okay, so he has all these like insane conspiracy theories about oil companies and car manufacturers. Yeah, like the carburetor lets you get hundred miles to the yeah. gallon, which the car companies. Yes, our city. No, the oil companies are suppressing, for, but no. why would the car companies suppress it? Don't they want those carburetors? The oil companies might not want them. So the original speech in the original cut of the movie was literally, and this might not sound long if you don't really pay attention to movies, stare at a clock for this length of time to get an idea how long this is. The original speech was 10 minutes long. 10 minutes of him just like doing conspiracy theories about like the environment. Audience that's really is, long for one monologue. Three minutes as long as we find out, because that's what they cut it down to. They they did um, screeners for it, and literally everyone walked out of the theater during the speech, because it was like so long and stupid. And so they cut it down. He had control, so like they couldn't cut it out entirely, but they cut it down to three minutes, and it's still too long, and it still has like the most insane... The stuff that didn't cut out included the carburetor that... like. I think he literally talks about a car that might run on water that, like, oh. is being suppressed. Hey, like, and you know what? That was suppressed because they used to have what's called the Locomobile. It was in the 1910s, and it ran. Well, not just water. You had to burn fire to boil the water, right. but it was a steam engine. It was a steam engine, but that's not what he's talking about. No, I know. He's talking an internal combustion engine that's that has water, water, yeah. water, yeah. I'd also like to point out that one of my favorite conspiracy theories of all time is from one of the uh, Tom McLaughlin movies. Yes. Trial, Trial of Billy Jack. Jack. In Trial of Billy Jack, where, the, where they explain that the reason we went into Vietnam was so Richard Nixon, by the way, didn't get us in Vietnam, <laughs> no. could sell heroin to our soldiers in Vietnam. Yes. This was the explanation to Vietnam, which I liked a lot. Even as a kid seeing this, I was like, wait a second, there's some holes in this theory. Yes. Like the fact that Richard Nixon wasn't in the war for, like, for the first like half yeah. of it. Yeah. And, in fact, uh, he was the third president involved. Yeah. So did Kennedy just take over the heroin market from yeah. Johnson or what the heck is going on? Anyway, it was pretty weird. So, That's um, also the movie that posits like there's a scene recreating the Mile uh, massacre, which also happens in Platoon, but is not as crazy. Because yeah. like, in Platoon, Stone, they kill like, like a yeah. couple dozen, which well, is and bad. Also, and Oliver, Oliver Stone was in Vietnam and like it's a more realistic about why. Yes, it Oliver happened. Stone knows what Vietnam a little bit. In Trial of Loughlin Billy Jack. The reason that they massacre the villagers is because they literally get a call from the White House. Yes, from Nixon directly. We must massacre these villagers. Like, and nobody Nixon... wants to do it, but the White House told them to. And, and Billy Jack is the only one who refuses to. 
You can imagine Richard Dixon caring about some random village in, in Vietnam. I mean, I'm not saying Richard Dixon's a good guy. Right. Lord but knows, I mean, so even I, speaking as a person that often votes Republican, I, I yeah. like this guy ruined my party. Right. I got yeah. it in for him. But I, don't, I find it hard to believe he would pick a specific village to be massacred. He also might have had better things to do with his time than, like, nitpick about... Well, he's got to get those heroin problems yes, he in, does, you know? right. So, uh, yeah, Trial Billy Jack has a, a, a surfeit of uh, wonderful conspiracy theories. If you like conspiracy theories... Which I don't. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> but, <laughs> there's a, a big scene where a bunch of hippies, who really do sound like hippies, and, like, they sound like they're all stoned, are talking about this invention they heard of that, like... You can listen to TV and it'll tell you it's a lie detector that'll work on somebody that's on TV. So like and they're all like, dude, what if like like Madison Avenue? Like, whoa. And and they're all talking about how the it would advertisements expose, aren't telling us yeah, the truth. It would all Mind expose well. like all the politicians and all the wow. but it's being suppressed. It's like, but they started by like, I heard there was a guy who was like maybe at MIT. And I'm like, this is a scripted movie. I'm like, couldn't you write this a little tighter? And and this is like a seven minute sequence. That movie is over three hours long though, so there's a that lot. That is of a long movie. I am not recommending Trial of Billy Jack because I it's love three Trial hours of Billy long. Jack. So. so it does have a scene where a little boy with hook hands <laughs> is holding his donkey and his gets shot, donkey. and it's heartwarming, um, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's supposed to be tragic, and it's not. I you're, you're I was I happy. was I was like, good job, no, no, murderous white guys. Uh, you're underselling it. Oh, am I? Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, like, there was a... Like, oh, yeah, because he's forced to shoot him. Yes, not only that, though. Okay, so earlier in the movie, we learn about the kid because they teach him to play a guitar. With so his hooks. This, with his hooks, because he has hooks for hands. He's And the holding, kid's great. I love the kid. He goes to protect his, his little burrow, but is, he's not holding the burrow. He's holding a bunny standing in front of the burrow, oh. and then, like... A, uh, a like the um, not even the army like it's the, the, national, the national guard. guard. So they're like guys who have families. Yes. So the national guard guy is ordered to shoot him, and he's like, I don't want to shoot him because he's a, a teeny boy with hooks around who's holding a rabbit. Who would want to shoot him? And he's obviously not a threat to the government. Yeah, he's he's not really doing anything, so I don't know why they. The would kids shoot him like eight, government. but he, it's the government, so it's they're gonna, the government's they're going to yeah. shoot children. It came straight from the White House. So the guy, the the guy ordering him. Again, says something like, we've been ordered to by mysterious forces above us. So the guy pulls out his own gun, puts it against the head of the other soldier, and says, if you don't shoot that boy, I'll murder you. And so the guy's kind of crying, but he shoots the kid. And then we, we see the kid in loving slow-mo as the bullet Yeah, like squibs. I said, I, that just, that, I was just so happy with that scene. It's, what did and I, I saw this in the drive-in theater as a teenager, and I was, like, fully on board with I think it was uh, Oscar Wilde who said, like, you have to have a heart of stone <laughs> not to laugh, laugh at the death of a little Nell. Nell. Yeah. yeah, so it's very similar. Uh, among the other people who die in slow motion at the end of Trial Billy Oh, yeah, Jack, all of Laughlin's family, you yes, said? Tri uh, Billy Jack, or Tom Laughlin, who's the director, who's also Billy Jack, uh, filmed the slow motion massacre of his wife and his daughter. Uh, and they're, they're, they're given these, like, slow-mo again with the, the bullet hits and everything. And I'm like, this is weird. Yeah, uh, I, don't I, want, I wouldn't <laughs> want to film that, you know? But, yeah. Uh, but, but they were committed to the cause, I guess. Those are very weird movies. I don't know where they would fit into the political spectrum now, but they are odd. They are very strange films. So if you want to see something that's really off the wall, I know Sandy hates them, and with good reason, but I kind of love them. So uh, if you have three and three hours, three and a half hours, uh, check out Trial Billy Jack.